accounts, Facebook, TikTok, whatnot. Um, bank accounts, if you have any form of bank accounts, you may or may not, your parents might have them. Still don't want anyone else to have that information. School accounts, you don't want someone going in and changing it, changing your assignment or something of the, a sort. Smartphone, I am sure lots of you have one of these. Have a password on them because if you lose it somewhere, someone can't just randomly open it and access all of your things. You want to be safe and secure, so have a password everywhere. Game accounts, Steam, Epic, League of Legends, what, whatever floats your boat for games. Many people put a lot of time and effort into those things and you don't want someone nefariously taking your progress and running with it. So passwords are important. Um, so a, a really good thing to have for passwords is something like a password manager. And they're really awesome because you don't have to remember the passwords. They can be cr a crazy string of characters that you don't know. I use, I use LastPass, it's one of the ones on here. And I don't know at least half of my passwords anymore because I have a master password through LastPass that is a, I don't remember how many long digit password, but it's not something that anyone is going to crack or get into to get the rest of my passwords. And so password managers let you have really unique passwords for every individual account. So your Facebook password can be different from your Twitter password, can be different from your TikTok password, can be different from your work password, can be different from your school password. And really, you want them all to be different. Why do you want them to be different? Because if somehow Facebook gets hacked and they get a giant slew of here's everyone's usernames and passwords, we can log into their accounts. Well, you need to go change that password, yes. But if that password is used everywhere, well, that password's already out and people already know what that password was and they can kind of put two and two together. You use this email address and this password for this one. Let's try that for Twitter instead and see if it works. So you want unique passwords because otherwise whenever one gets compromised, you have to change every single password. Um, so password managers really make it a lot easier to do that. And some of the really nice ones are actually free to use. Uh, some of them have better features if you pay a little bit of money for it, but, um, but there are free ones out there. And so we always recommend having a strong password, using a password manager. And to make a strong password, um, the, the security world's kind of gone from this whole really kind of short, complicated um, password to a much longer passphrase. And I'm going to jump over here to my XKDC comic that's been around for quite a while and still pretty well holds true. Um, you can see the first one is Troubadour. And three, we changed some, some letters to numbers. I will almost never remember those passwords unless I use it a lot. And at the time of the making of this comment, you could, it could be guessed by a computer just randomly guessing at 1,000 guesses per second in about three days. This comic is at least five years old and technology ramps up really well. So realistically, it's probably quicker than that now. Uh, and it's a really hard password to remember. Whereas the wonderful phrase, correct horse battery staple, makes absolutely no sense in any shape, 
or form in terms of a sentence, but for the sheer length of password going at the same guess rate was going to take it 550 years as opposed to days. And so really long passwords actually make a difference. And it's one of those, they, they kind of joke around and say, you've already memorized memorized the four random words. And one person, one thing that someone told me at one point in time was pick four things off of your desk and make a password out of it. And so I kind of did that earlier today. And my answer was cracker, mouse, arctic, light, because I have cracker barrel mints, I have a mouse, I have arctic mints, I have a little flashlight. So it's one of those, you can pick four random words seemingly off your desk and you can create a much better, much better password in general. Um, but that being said, if you use a password manager, a lot of them have built in password generators for you. So it will just auto generate a password of however long you would like it to be. It can be 23 characters long and it will be a jumbled mess of makes absolutely no sense. And it will be even better than that. So really password managers are your way to go. I, I preach password managers to a lot of people and was like, they're great, you should use them. Um, so on to the next thing, two-factor authentication. Um, we semi-recently did this for work. A lot of people have gotten moved over to our two-factor authentication for work. But what it does is it says, okay, uh, you have your username and your password to log in. All right, that's two, two things to say that you know who you are. Can you prove that you have something that we know that is yours, which would be this, and it will send a notification to my phone and say, hey, you're trying to sign in. Is this you? Do you want to allow this to sign in? And I have to click yes on my phone before it allow me to sign in on my computer. And what that really does is it just adds another, another security feature because you're now saying, I know who I am. That's my username. I know my secret, which is my password. And I have this device that I originally told you, this is mine, I will have it, you can talk to me on it. So you have three ways of saying, hey, I'm me, you should let me in. It's a really, really good thing. And it makes a lot things a lot harder for someone to break into accounts. Um, social media safety. Um, Keep your privacy settings on. I cannot stress that enough. Um, if you are on Facebook and you realize that you can look up Joe Schmo and you can see everything he's posted from 2012 to now, that's not a good thing because then every, everyone can see what Joe Schmo is doing. And that's, that's not okay. There's, you want to keep it, to you and your friends and whatnot. So keep your privacy setting on. Think about things before you post them. Nothing can be deleted from the internet, no matter how hard you try. I have had a few people ask me how to delete things from the internet. And my answer is, and still will be, you can't. You can vanish that post from Facebook, but there's always going to be an archive of it. Someone may have taken a picture of it. Someone may have done something. There's going to be a record of it somewhere on the internet. It's kind of, a, it's kind of backed up on a routine basis. Nothing will ever go away fully. Um, so I, I also skipped one of my bullet points of, post about things that happened, not that are happening. Um, many of you might be coming up to Stillwater for Roundup next week, which is awesome. 
we love having 4-Hers on campus for Roundup. It's always a good time. But one thing you should think about is, does everyone need to know that I'm not home? Does everyone need to know this? They can see, hey, I had a great time at Roundup. But if your whole family ends up going on vacation and you check in on Facebook at Hawaii, well, now all your friends and family and anyone else who has access to your account know that you aren't home and neither is your family and makes for a much easier time of, hey, we know they're not there. We can stop by, see what all they have, see if we can snag a computer or a TV while we're there. It's something that you're just asking for unwanted attention. And again, use a good password or password manager. I'm gonna keep throwing that in there. Um, social engineering is a interesting type of thing. It's a psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. In a nutshell, what they're trying to get you to do is through clever, clever use of words, they want to get something out of you. And the most common thing here is phishing. And phishing strategies are, they'll come in email, online chats, the personality quizzes that were on Facebook for the longest time, browser hijacks. Every now and then you might come across a web page that'll say stop and just keep flashing at you. Call Microsoft to, to get your computer from being fully infected by a virus. Those are, they're all phishing strategies. They're wanting you to click on the links there. They're wanting your credit card information. That's all a phishing strategy. You'll get the scam calls of you just want a free cruise or something of the sort. They're all just looking for information on you. But what do they want to know about you? Um, well, they want to know a lot of things. They want to know your name. They want to know how old you are. They want to know where you live, where you went to school, where you might work, who your friends are, favorite colors, pets' names, information about your parents, your birthday, your social security number. They want to know a lot of information. And you shouldn't give any of this out to people you don't know. Um, and the reason why is one, it makes identity, identity theft a lot easier. Um, but on the other part of that is a lot of those answers are security questions that have kind of those kind of gone a little on the wayside, but they're still they're still fairly common of, hey, where did you go to school? What was your first car? What's your mother's maiden name? They want to know the answer to these security questions so they can go in and say, hey, I forgot my password. My mother's maiden name is so-and-so. I went to school in Stillwater and my favorite, my favorite, ooh, my favorite mascot. Uh, he went to OSU, it's probably Cowboys. And so they, that's why they want this information. And Knowing these things, it just makes phishing attacks more direct and a lot easier for you to fall for them. Um, the email ones, this is a kind of an old picture from a PayPal one, but it looks like a fairly legitimate email, minus my little circle and whatnot. Of, it doesn't tell you the name. It just says, hey, we need to, you to log in and verify your account. But if I didn't go to PayPal and request something of the sort from PayPal, say maybe I logged in and it wanted to say, hey, we noticed that you're trying to log in. Do you want to allow that to log in? That might be a fairly legitimate email. That's happened to me in the past week. Not necessarily with PayPal, but in general, that's happened. But something like this, where it's out of the blue, it's very generic. It says, dear customer. It didn't say, hey, Isaac, we noticed you logging in. It's a blanket statement. And it doesn't really give you 
what you're clicking on. So be wary of those. Uh, common chat things, they're, again, just looking for information. This one was a really generic thing with a link wanting you to click on it. And then the Facebook security, you can kind of see security is a little weird on spelling. There's just little nuances that kind of tell you what's going on. Then I have a little Minecraft chat of um, someone kind of get, getting more information than they really need to. Um, Facebook quizzes, like I said, it mostly is going to give out information for those security questions that you really don't want people to have. Um, Facebook check-in and snap maps and TikTok might have something of the sort, I don't remember. Uh, but I am a very big advocate of don't use them because I don't like people knowing exactly where I am when they really don't need to know. So it tells people where you are when you're not at home. If someone is particularly malicious, they can kind of keep track of, hey, I know you leave your house at 745 every minute to get to work every, every morning. And you're not back till 5.30 in the afternoon. Or, you know, actually, you, every Tuesday and Thursday, you don't show up back till about 8 o'clock because you went and walked around the lake and then you had dinner and then you make it home. It's one of those things of people don't need to know that information for the most part. They don't need to know your every schedule by every minute. And it's just a safety thing. So keep your privacy settings turned on and be wary of what you post and who knows where you are. And so my little recap on our little safety thing is use a password manager. I told you I wasn't done talking about those. They're awesome, really use them. Um, keep your privacy settings turned on for social media. Watch out for common scams. They're really kind of apparent and they come out all too often. If you're not expecting something from someone, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen. And think before you type or post. And again, I didn't go over this, but really, if it appears too good to be true, it is too good to be true. A Nigerian prince did not just leave you all of their money. Money, Unfortunately, it, I, I just can't, it just doesn't happen. So anyways, that's my little tidbit about safety. And I'm going to send it off over to Levi, who's going to have lots of fun talking to us about the parts of a computer. Thanks, Isaac. Hi, everyone. I'm Levi Arnold. I am a DASNR IT computer support specialist for the Northeast District of Extension. Uh, so we're happy to have you guys with us today. And as, as Isaac said, I'm going to be talking to you all about components of a computer. So instead of just showing you pictures of them or just talking about them in general, I thought we would have a little more fun than that and go ahead and look specifically at a computer. And so we can see what's going on with it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Isaac and Bronson to turn off your cameras. Um, that way that we have just a perfect view of a full computer here. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. This is a computer. This is the front. This is the back. Guys, I'm kidding. We're gonna look at more than just the front and the back of the computer. <laughs> so let's go ahead and dig into it. So, uh, before I jump in too far, I want to go ahead and give a huge warning. Absolutely do not do this to a computer you have at home, especially if it's a fully functioning computer. Uh, if you do this and take it apart, it very likely will no longer function correctly. So if you're going to do this, make sure you're helping, you have a parent helping you, make sure it is not plugged in. We don't have anything plugged in. And make sure it's an older computer that you don't care about and then you don't need anything off of. Um, if you don't know for sure, ask a parent, ask a friend, ask someone because they will definitely tell you. Okay, 
So let's jump in and get started. So let's start with this down here. This, pull off, is a graphics card. So what a graphics card does is it helps your computer display graphics. These are very useful if you have games uh, because uh, it helps with the processor of your computer and it can handle more powerful games and it can help speed up your computer over time. So one thing about this, this, this graphics card can handle three um, monitor outputs at one time. Um, not all computers have to have graphics cards. If I show you the back of this computer, you're going to see over here, there is a VGA port and a display port right there. So this computer doesn't necessarily have to have a graphics card, but it does help with processing. Um, so it gives several benefits with it, and it's just something you can add to computers over time if your computer slows down or if you want to play more games. Let's go ahead and talk about the next one, which is RAM. I'm going to go ahead and pull these out. This is a stick or a DIM of RAM. This computer, as you can see, has four of these. So what RAM is, is it is a short-term memory device. Um, you know, you usually think when you think of memory, you think of a hard drive, which is long-term RAM storage. What uh, is, is long-term storage for memory? RAM is short-term. So what it does is it's kind of like a waiting room at your doctor's office. And what it does is it holds things very shortly or very temporary before your processor can think about them or process. Also the difference between RAM or memory in a hard drive is that it is much, much faster than your hard drives are. Even the newer style hard drives like solid state drives, and we'll talk about those and look at them here in a second, but it allows you to do things that, um, it allows you to store things and access them very quickly. Um, newer computers, you're going to have bigger amounts of RAM and if you're going to do things like play games, you're going to want to have large amounts of RAM. Uh, standard amounts of RAM are, you know, four gigabytes, which is fairly small now, uh, eight to gigabytes, and more common are going to be 16 gigabytes. And then you start getting into the higher amounts, which are 32 or uh, 64. And you can see this motherboard has four slots that these go in. You'll also notice that we've got a white lever and a black lever here. Um, and, you, and you know, there's two of those on each one. Those are in pairs. So there's a white one and a white one. If you were installing two sticks of RAM, you would make sure to put those into the white or the black. Um, and that way they would work in correlation and it gives a little bit of a performance boost. Not all computers are like that. Some of them will only have two slots of RAM. Some of them might only have one. So that is RAM. Let's keep moving on. We're gonna continue on the storage aspect and we're gonna talk about the hard drive. So here is this computer's hard drive. Um, as I said, or um, what I should say is this computer is a fully functioning computer. Um, we could have plugged it in and turned it on and it would fully function. Uh, this is a little bit older of a computer, which is why we're using it. Um, so we don't have to worry about needing it again. We're in the, in the process of getting rid of it. So this is a hard drive. This hard drive does have a 500 gigabyte storage amount. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of hard to see. Um, this is a three and a half inch hard drive, which is uh, most common in desktops. Just for reference, this is a two and a half inch drive, which is more common for a laptop. Um, so we'll go over those a little bit more in the in a minute, but this is the hard drive. Okay, let's keep on going. Most people, when they see this right here, they instantly think this is the processor. So this is not actually the processor. This is just a cooler for the processor, but we can pull that out. What happens with these is when processors are working, when they're turned on, they can get very hot, especially if you're playing games or processing uh, videos or uh, working with uh, photos. 
And so it needs some way to get the heat off of that processor so it doesn't get too hot and burn out. And this is just one easy way that they have it. This is a very good conductor and you'll see this right here or this down here is paste. Um, and what they do is it allows it to transfer heat more easier. And it goes all through these fins and this, span, this fan spins up and it pushes air through it and it helps it disperse that heat. So that processor is not going to have problems over time. This down here is actually the processor. So I'm gonna go ahead and unhook that. And I'm gonna pull that processor straight off of that board. This is the processor. You see it still has that thermal paste on the, on the top of it. If we turn it over, you're going to see all of these little dots. And if you look on down here on the motherboard, you'll also see there's a whole bunch of little pins. I know that's it's kind of hard to see, but there's little pins that make connections to all of these dots. And that is how it specifically connects to the motherboard and how it works with your computer. Uh, processors are upgradable. Um, you have to usually pair them with the correct motherboard socket. Um, if you bought a computer and it's got a slow processor, for instance, an i3 or an i5 processor, you could upgrade it. Uh, this one is an i5 or an i7, I'm sorry. Uh, so it is a more powerful processor and it can handle quite a bit of data going through it. Okay, so down here, keep working our way down. This green whole board is called the motherboard. And what the motherboard does is it basically takes all of the different components of the computer and it, it merges them or it pulls them together and uses all of them in correlation. It's the main connector of the computer. It's the backbone, basically. Um, this one is a, a very good one. It does have slots for a graphics card, which is called a PCIe slot. It does have four DIMMs of RAM. And it also has a lot of different connections for us, like SATA slots for your hard drives. Okay, so last couple components of this I'm gonna talk about. This computer case does have a DVD drive, uh, which is right here. I don't know if I can actually pull this out or not, so we're gonna test. Yeah. Maybe. Pull the front of this case off. There is our DVD drive. As I said, this is an older computer and you can actually see this because of the amount of dust on it. And I actually did clean this a little bit. Um, but here is a DVD drive. Uh, it's what it looks like when you pull it out. I'm not gonna actually open this up so you see the inside of it, but it's just got standard connections at the, at the back and it just slides right into your computer case. Okay, the last thing we're gonna talk about here is this which is your power supply. So this is what takes the power from your plug-in and it takes it all into this cable and it puts them in different voltages and different wattages for the different components. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of different computer, uh, different cables here. And what's that do, what that does is it takes them and puts them in very specific power requirements and puts it into the correct place. If you accidentally got those mixed up or if they made those wrong, it would burn out this motherboard and it would go ahead and you would actually see smoke coming out of it and it would do some things that would be very, very bad over time. Okay, so that's the main computer components of a computer. I want to go ahead and talk about a couple of those things though while we're here. So we looked at some different hard drives here. So once again, this is a 3.5 inch drive. This is a 2.5 inch drive. What I wanted to go ahead and do is just show you what the inside of these look like. So once again, don't ever do this with a working computer. If this hard drive had data on it, it would no longer function after touching this. So you never want to do this. Um, these can be repaired if you have one that goes out but most likely you have to send it into a company like Seagate, which is one of the main companies that makes these hard drives. 
and they go into a full clean room where they wear white covered gowns over them, face masks, gloves. They make sure there's no dust or anything at all in the room. Um, and then they can go in and actually pull this stuff out and remove it. So you can see this right here, it spins. Uh, these are called hard drive platters. Uh, which the easiest way to explain these is they're like a DVD, DVD or CD. This spins very quickly. This one, this hard drive is a 7,200 revolutions per minute hard drive. So this spins 7,200 revolutions per minute. And this is the read and write arms and they go back and forth and read data off of this hard drive, kind of like it's a CD. Uh, it's got some very strong magnets in here that work with that, and that is basically, in a nutshell, how it works. So this is the 2.5-inch drive. This is basically for laptops, and you can see it is the exact same principle. The only thing that is, it is a very, it's a much smaller device. Everything's more compact and everything's smaller. This one is a 5,400 revolution per minute drive. Um, and you can see that here listed on this label. It's kind of hard to see. There we go. So those are two styles of hard drives. We've got some others here I wanted to go ahead and show you. There's newer style of hard drives, which are called solid state drives. And there's different iterations of them. Some of them will be the same form factor as this hard drive. Uh, but the, the main difference with solid states versus traditional hard drives or hard disk drives um, is that they do not have a moving components. So these are kind Levi, of the, the focus is out a little bit. Could you? Okay. Yeah. There we go. It kind of comes and goes on me. So this is a M.2 M.2 solid state drive. Once again, the difference is, is this has no moving components. It's almost a little more similar to RAM, but the difference is, is this can store it long-term and it retains storage when the computer turns off. This does not. RAM does not retain storage when your computer goes off. That's why it's only temporary internet uh, storage, whereas this is long-term storage. So this is an M.2 drive. I also wanted to go ahead and show you a flash drive. So a lot of you have flash drives. Once again, do not do this unless you're really ready for it not to work anymore. And you can see the difference of these. They're actually very similar. What's funny is this is uh, one of the first flash drives I ever got. And this was a 128 megabyte. No, I'm sorry. It's a 512 megabyte. Um, flash drive. This one is a 128 gigabyte flash drive, which is a huge difference in the amount of storage. Uh, but it's just kind of funny how it how it goes over. Okay, I've got a couple other things to show you guys. Who knows what this is? You can either unmute yourself and tell me, or you can type it in the text chat, and I'll try to see what is this. Anyone? Okay. Okay, there you go. Uh, Tia said this is a floppy disk. And you're so close. This is actually not a floppy disk. It's the newer version of a floppy disk called a diskette. Okay? And let me show you why. This is a floppy disk. And the reason why they call them floppy disks is because you can take them and you can bend them and they'll still work and you can sit there and flap them and it's not going to cause any problems. This one, if you try to bend it, it'll bend a little bit, but if you bend it very much, it'll snap in half. Whereas this one, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it and it's gonna be fine. So uh, this is a four and a half inch floppy disk. There's actually a larger size of this that was out there that was about eight inches. And those were the original floppy disks that you could really flap and they would make a lot of noise and have fun with them. 
So this is the older version of this. This is a floppy disk. Yeah. <laughs> yep. This is a diskette. There is also a newer iteration of these called a zip disk. And these were the last real iterations of the disks, uh, disk drives like these that were mobile storage. This one was 100 megabyte. There was also some larger ones. But one thing you'll notice is that this one is a lot larger than this one. Yep. Uh, one thing Bronson said in the chat is it's a common misnomer, and that's correct. Uh, a lot of people think these are floppy uh, disks or floppy, um, and they're, they're not. They're diskettes, but everyone does that. You'll also recognize this. This is the save button on most of your programs. It'll look exactly like that. So I wanted to go ahead and, and, and show you even one that's further back. This one, which most people will know these from, game system. This is a cartridge. And these were an earlier standard of saving data. So this is an old system that you would actually take this and plug it into like it's a Super Nintendo or a Nintendo 64. Some of you have probably seen some of those or even Atari's. Um, and you snap it in there. Um, and you could turn it on, it would start working. And if they didn't work, of course, you had to do the whole blow it out thing to see if you could get it to work because sometimes they got dust on them and would stop working. One last thing I wanted to show you here was this right here. So this is a disk platter, just like these hard drives have them. This is an older model, so you see how big it is. So this came out of a huge hard drive. Um, but you can see it's double-sided, so it has spaces to store stuff on both sides of them. Um, and this would, of course, spin very well or very fast, uh, probably 5,400 RPMs or slower because of how big this is. But that's basically what a hard drive platter looked like. Okay, I have covered a lot of different fun stuff here today. Um, just wanted to go ahead and reiterate here really quick that you know, if you guys have a computer at home and you want to have fun with it, make sure it's not a working computer because you absolutely do not want to take apart and run one of your working computers. Um, so if you're going to take it apart and look at stuff, make sure that you talk with your parents. They'll probably want to be there with you. Also make sure that it is fully unplugged, no power whatsoever at all because it can hurt you. Uh, so just be very careful. Okay, thank you guys very much for listening to me with this. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bronson. See you later. Okay, thanks, Levi. Let me go ahead and get my screen shared. Fortunately, another boring PowerPoint, but I'll try to keep it as, as infotained as possible. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today if, as long as you can see that, can you guys see that? Yeah, looks good. You do. Okay, thanks. Um, is what to look for when buying tech for school. And basically, you know, anytime you go to college, some of the colleges, the different colleges are gonna want you to have a laptop on top of specific specifications for that laptop. So you wanna make sure that, um, whenever you're getting ready to purchase, you know what you're looking for. And so now that Levi has shown you the components and kind of what they do, hopefully you'll understand what the specifications you need for a computer are. So the first thing's first. If you're gonna to go to a specific school and a specific degree program, you want to check with that school first to see if they have a specific recommended computer. Um, you know, some of the common brands you see out there, Dell, Mac, HP, Acer, Asus, um, they are all different computers, but they have different specs to them and you can purchase them with different specs as well. So what I always recommend doing first is check your university's website. This is just an example of OSU and the College of, of Engineering, Architecture and Technology and they have a recommended specifications for laptops coming into the school. And, and all I did to find this was just go to the OSU website 
and search for it. Search for laptop recommendations, or you could even contact the um, prospective student workers in each department and see if they have a, a list of specifications to go based off of. Some of the things that are definitely not recommended. Now, they're not recommended. That's not saying that it, they won't work but they are not recommended because of some limitations that you have. One of them is Apple Macintosh computers for engineering students. And really the only reason that's so is because most of the engineering software that you find is actually not gonna work on a Mac OS. So you can use them, but you have to buy more software to emulate Windows and blah, blah, blah and so on. So if you, if you know you're gonna be going for engineering, you definitely wanna stay away from Macs. And one thing to note, guys, college is not like high school as far as you know, getting the elite computers. It's really, you really need to get something that is gonna be for you. Nobody's gonna care that you have the latest and greatest Mac or you know, that you've got an iPhone 12 Pro or whatever the latest version is. It's just not that way like it is in high school. So. If you're going to get a laptop, be sure to get one specifically for your school and your degree program. Now, as far as the processors go, Core i3s and Ryzen 3 processors or lower, because there are some called um, Pentiums and Centrinos and things like that. They're not recommended just because they are very limited in the power, the power that they can do. As well as Chromebooks, you definitely don't want to get that for a full-time laptop use in, in school. Now they're fine for just taking notes and things like that, but Chromebooks again are limited, just like Mac OS. There's a lot of software that doesn't work on a Chrome, uh, on the Google Chrome OS. So keep that in mind before you're um, wanting to go out and look for computers. Now these are some recommendations. Don't, you know, don't take these as gospel or anything like that, but you definitely want to look at minimum a Core i5 or a Ryzen 5 processor. You know, if you can afford it, great, go up to the i7 or the i9, and the same with the AMD, the, the Ryzen 7 and 9. But if, you know, if you're, if you're trying to penny pinch a little bit, trying to save a little bit of money, i5s and, and Ryzen 5s will usually get you through school. Now, as far as the RAM goes, and remember that's that temporary storage, the more the better. The more RAM you have, the more things that you can be doing at the same time. You can multitask. You can play music, you can be surfing the web, you can play a video, you can have you know, your AutoCAD running, whatever you're trying to do, the more RAM, the better. Eight gigabytes is definitely a minimum. You don't wanna go below eight. 16 and 32 are even better. So if you can afford it, definitely get at least 16. Now, hard drive or solid state drive. Um, one of the things that, he's, that he mentioned was the fact that you know, a new solid state drive doesn't have moving parts. And that's, that's a great benefit, but it's, there's also another benefit. Solid state drives are a lot faster than your regular standard old hard drives. Now, that means that you're not gonna get as much storage for the money, but it is definitely recommended that if you can afford it, get a solid state drive in that laptop or desktop. Um, these are just some examples of the minimums that we would recommend. So a standard hard drive, look at about 500 gigabytes. You know, they make them one terabyte, which is twice that, uh, two terabytes, four terabytes, they make them really big. They also um, make your um, solid state drives in 256, you know, but they also make them in, in the 500 gigabytes, the one terabytes, but they're going to be a lot more expensive if you go that route. Now, recently, they have come down quite a bit, but who knows with, you know, the worldwide um, shortages that are going on, what the prices are going to be. And yeah, like Levi said, they are a lot faster, definitely recommended. Now, when we're talking about video card, there's one thing to know, you know, if you're going to be doing any video gaming, you know, if you like video gaming, or if you're going to be doing any engineering things 
like AutoCAD or any of the Autodesk softwares, rendering for art, things like that, you're gonna want an extra video card. Um, some processors, you don't need the video cards, but it definitely makes a difference whenever you're doing those games or the uh, renderings or the AutoCAD and stuff like that. So definitely recommend those. Now they are, again, because of the worldwide chip shortage, they are very expensive right now, but you can usually find them built with computers. So um, definitely look into that. As far as the software goes, whenever you're thinking about coming to school, check with your school first. They might actually have this software available to you at no cost. Um, for example, here at Oklahoma State, as a student, you get access to the entire Microsoft suite. So you get Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all of those. You get um, access to the Autodesk if you're an engineering student and usually get access to SAS or some other statistics program. Um, you know, there are some free ones out there like R or, you know, others, but there are some, some software that is available at the university at no additional cost to you. So definitely check with your, your school's IT first. And then this is just a list of some common software that you might find Office 365, the actual Windows 10 uh, operating system, you're, want, you're going to want, definitely want some sort of antivirus software on there. So there's Norton, McAfee, uh, Webroot, all those Malwarebytes, all those out there are definitely options that you wanna look at. Um, and then Parallels and Wine are software that works on Mac computers that will let you run Windows applications. So if you do have a Mac already and you're going into engineering or something like that, you're gonna to have to look at some of these programs that will let you run Windows um, and Windows applications instead of just your standard Mac operating system. And then there is a bunch of free software out there, you know, uh, Chrome web browser, Firefox web browser, um, 7-Zip is a multi-functional um, compression tool that allows you to unzip RAR files or zip files, that sort of thing, uh, free. So definitely check that out. And then um, down below there, you've got Java and your Adobe Acrobat Reader. Now with the Adobe Acrobat Reader, that's that big red square down there in the bottom middle. Um, you can view PDFs and you can usually fill out PDF forms and things like that, but you're not gonna be able to edit PDFs. You have to have the full-fledged um, paid for version of Acrobat before you can do something like that. But the reader is free. So these are some considerations that we usually like to make whenever we're recommending new laptops or desktops for um, incoming students or, or even faculty and staff. So if you're wanting portability, you definitely want something smaller. It's gonna be lighter, it's gonna be smaller. Uh, 13 inches or smaller is definitely um, doable. You might want a touch screen with a stylus for taking notes, or if you're maybe an art major, you can you know, use that as a sketching pad, something like that. Surface Pro started about 750. So you know, if you're looking for something like that, that's, that's a good starting point to think about. Uh, they do make cheaper models with touch screens, but the Surface Pro is kind of a, you know, something that's easy to use as a tablet as well but it has the full-fledged windows on it so you can install software. Now, if you're just coming to school, you're not going into engineering, you're not going into um, you know, art or anything like that. You're just gonna go you know, standard uh, major like English or history or, or, or stuff like that. You might wanna just look at a standard laptop. Bigger screens may be easier to read for you. They're making them lighter and lighter every year. So, um, whoops. You might also consider an external monitor and a docking station for your desk at home though. Um, that way you can have a bigger screen and still be able to use your laptop with that bigger screen when you're at the house. And, you know, laptops are getting cheaper and cheaper every year. So, you know, there's decent laptops at Best Buy starting at 600, probably even starting at 500 this year. So you've got that option. Um, now, if you're going into engineering or, or gaming, you're gonna want higher specs and there's really no price. You know, it just depends on the specs that you get. 
depends on what's in it, what you put in it. If you build your own, there's just a lot of different options when you're talking about building your own computer or getting a computer for those engineering schools. Now, be sure to check education discounts. You know, manufacturers like Dell and HP, they all have a 10% off, um, sometimes even more on computer purchases. Also check with your school. Uh, Orange Tech here at the university actually has bundles that you can get with different computers and, you know, service um, costs and things like that. You can bundle them and save some money. So definitely check with your school as well before purchasing. And also, you know, if you, you know, if you're trying to penny pinch and you, you just can't afford that high-end machine, keep in mind, most schools have computer labs with printers and they usually have additional software installed on those computers as well. I know that, you know, we have a, a Mac lab here in Ag Hall. We have a standard PC, several standard PC labs that have all the software on them. So if you're, you know, you, you're trying to save some money, you, you can't afford to get that high-end machine. We do have machines here, and I'm sure they do at every university that you can take advantage of. And we even have laptops and tablets that you can check out with the library. So keep that in mind. Okay, well, thank you guys for coming today. Um, do you, does anybody have any questions for any of us, any th all three of us, we're, we're here for answering any questions um, or any insights that you guys have that, to share, that, that would be great. Um, so let us know. And feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat, that's fine. All right, well, I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. So uh, again, guys, thanks for coming out. Hopefully we were able to shed some light on some computer uh, misconceptions or maybe just you know kind of answer some questions you had about thinking about purchasing laptops or desktops. But um, thank you guys again for coming and I hope you guys have a great 4-H roundup. Bye. Thank you so much to our three presenters for being with us today and helping us out. We really appreciate your time. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop recording. And then we do have a break for all the participants. We do have a break until one. So um, take a break, eat some lunch, and we'll be back at one for our next workshop. Thank you. Thank you.